Well, this is just such a wonderful conference. It's just been a great day. Thank you very much to Rachel, Holly, Graham, Michelle for having me back for a second year. I'm delighted to present again. Well, today I'm going to be talking about three very difficult words, disruption, denial, and transition. And I'm going to be talking about them in a very unique and different way. The perspective I want to give is from the perspective of an energy file. Now, that suffix file, P-H-I-L-E, in Latin is someone who has great passion in a subject, an aficionado, someone who takes interest. And in many ways, you all here being at this conference are energy files to varying degrees. You're interested in energy. But I have to admit, personally, I'm rather at the extreme end of the spectrum as an energy file. And so, you know, I love energy. I live and breathe it every day. I collect postcards, I collect objects. I've got a museum of all sorts of interesting curiosities. I go on vacation and I take pictures. And actually, given that it's the end of the day, I'll show you a few vacation pictures here. I trust everyone had a good summer. There's. Uh, my wife and I, over in the, in, the, in the left, we went to Europe, had a great time, saw all sorts of things, the perfunctory tourist photos that one would take, and uh, other family photos, and of course, the obligatory martini. But I take a lot of vacation photos of my family, of course, but what I really like to do is be on the lookout for interesting energy things, things and scenes that tell a story. And so it was that I got some great shots this summer. And so here's an interesting thing. And you know, whenever I take a shot, I always think about, okay, well, what is this telling me? What, 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 is, the, what is the story around a photo like this? Well, we've got here the Boris Vilkitsky. It's a modern Russian LNG tanker docked in Europe, built in 2017. And the Vilkitsky is delivering natural gas. But the, so I guess there's a little bit of a geopolitical angle to this whole thing, Russian gas in Europe. But the interesting part of the photo, of course, is how the LNG tanker is surrounded by the wind turbines. And so we could take the narrative in one of two directions here. The first direction would be that renewables are surrounding and choking off natural gas and fossil fuels, and therefore this is a transition story. An alternate interpretation might be, we need all energy systems, especially if we're going to, say, put coal out of business, we've got LNG and we've got wind, and that they are symbiotic in terms of doing so. Okay, well, you're sort of starting to get warmed up to the idea of how to do interpretation of scenery and stories, and so that's what I do. Whenever I travel, I pack my camera, and whether it's a museum, whether it's an oil field, whether it's a highway in the mountains of Peru, I'm going to take pictures. Or whether it's an electrical pole, solar panels, or of course this summer, the big story in photos, uh, you know, scooters and electric bikes on the bottom right-hand side. But for me, this summer, I took the trophy photo. I got the trophy photo that I was really wanting, and that's this one over here. So it's rather a pretty photo, but here we have an oil tanker in the English Channel. It is sailing towards an army of wind turbines, and one can have the narrative of the epic market share clash. And the crimson sun and sun setting over oil, and the oil tanker is indicative of who is going to win this battle, oil as the sunset industry. Well. That's an interesting interpretation, and you can think about that. It can be the basis of discussion. Now, I think we can agree, you know, sunsets always make for a good photo, and that it's, uh, it's, it's quite an appealing one. But that's not why it was a trophy photo. That's not why it was a trophy photo. The trophy photo is because the narrative that I just gave you is not new. And a week prior, I was with my wife in the National Gallery in London, place where we like to go as art files or art aficionados. And it was only a week earlier that I had studied and examined one of the most famous photos in the gallery, and that is the 1839 painting by John William Mallard Turner. Mr. Turner painted the fighting temeraire with a lot of hidden messages. 
And we can see in the background the Temeraire, which is the name of the majestic fighting ship that was a veteran of the Battle of Trafalgar alongside Admiral Nelson. But yet, look at the photo. It's almost ghostly, pale, skeletal, as it is being pulled by the more colorful coal-fired ship as it tugs it to its final resting place. In fact, the true full title of the painting is The Fighting Temeraire Tugging sorry, being tugged to its final birth for being broken up, to be broken up. You know, art history is also full of very subtle messages, which is what the great artists used to do. And in interpreting this, you can see, again, the crimson sunset, much as in my photo. And that was by no accident. Turner explicitly was trying to show that wind-powered sailing ships were history. The sun was setting on them, and the new age of coal and industrialization was the modernity. That's not me telling the story. This is documented by art historians. This is one of the top 10 most famous paintings in the National Gallery by public vote. I would argue it is the top energy transition piece of art in the world. And I would argue that Maybe Mr. Turner was also an energy economist for diarizing this. Actually, no. Because really to understand this narrative of transition from the demise of wind to the rise of coal, as if it happened relatively quickly and overnight, can be found if you actually cross the River Thames to the other side of London, and maybe some of you have been to the Museum of the Cuddy Sark. The Cuddy Sark was commissioned in 1869, a majestic clipper sailing ship. 1869, well, that's 30 years after Turner's painting. So, well, wait a minute, I thought sail ships were dead. No, and in fact, a clipper sailing ship like the famous Cuddy Sark could outpace a coal-fired freighter all the way to the end of the 1800s taking cargoes like tea from Southeast Asia back to England. There's two lessons we can infer from this story. One, that the incumbent energy system, wind, will always fight back and innovate. They built the Cuddy Sark with much higher masts, much bigger to carry more cargo, and sheathed the hull in copper. It was an extremely fast and competitive ship. Yet the second lesson that we could take away, because we know ultimately that there was an energy transition from wind to coal, was that only the leanest and meanest can stay in the business. The lowest costs and the most efficient players in the sailing business will last. Well, I'll let you digest that and think about how it applies to my oil tanker story. I also take pictures of chimneys. Seems like an obscure thing to do, but chimneys are interesting. Chimneys are a symbol, really, of the combustion age. Chimney is also a symbol of, frankly, certainly of this vintage, extreme wastage, inefficiency. So it's not only emissions, but it's also that 80-plus percent of the energy that you burn goes up the stack as waste, as waste heat. So. That's interesting, but, you know, actually, uh, this is more of a social ethical story that I want to tell you, and that chimneys have a rather grim history, because to clean the chimneys required chimney sweeps. This is not the Mary Poppins-type chimney sweep, but rather climbing boys, in other words, enslaved children who had to go up the chimneys as young as the age of six. And in fact, I have a library in my own personal collection of literature, which is rather grim. This is Henry Haworth in the 1830s, who was suffocated in a chimney. Of course, this brings about sort of the ethical questions of energy use. But the real story here, actually, if we dig a little bit deeper, is that the technology actually existed to displace climbing boys 
very early on in the 1800s. And in fact, there was policy in place to ban the practice entirely, recognizing the unethical and rather despicable thing. They actually had mechanical contraptions to clean out the chimneys early in the 1800s. Yet the practice didn't end till 1875. And so we say, why? Well, there's many reasons, including the microeconomics of a household, self-interest, social status, and other very social human dynamics and denial that this is an issue amongst people who enjoyed the comforts of heat in their home. I'll come back to this, but I'll say it because it's worth saying again. Technology by itself is not a sufficient condition for transition and substitution of processes. Well, let's explore the whole social aspect of this, particularly the social stratification. So on a more cheery note, on vacation, I'll take you to Giverny in France, and in the spirit of Impressionist painting, this is Claude Monet's house. Very large house, and Mr. Monet was a very wealthy man selling his paintings. And if you own one of the paintings, you'd be very wealthy too. Large house, and I've often studied and written about the relationship between wealth, energy use, and by extension, things like emissions. Wealth and energy use are very tightly correlated because the more you make, the more wealthy you are, the bigger the appliances that you buy, the bigger the homes that you buy. And Mr. Monet had a very big kitchen and a very big stove. And I took this one with great interest because in my personal museum and collection of things, I have the actual catalog from 1880 that Mr. Monet would have bought this stove from. So I know the sizes of the stoves in the catalog, and I know he bought the biggest one. And so we have all the way from the smallest, based on your budget, to very wealthy, to ultra-wealthy, nobility. We have here a picture now, we're in the Lisbon area in Sintra, for those of you who have been, the palace at Sintra. Gigantic kitchen, enough to cook entire animals on a spit. And so we you know, sort of paint this idea of the wealthier you are, the more energy you use. And actually, it goes further if you think about the psychology and you look back in the history of imagery and paintings and objects that actually there is an egotistical component to it that you want to show it off. Right? It's sort of the human nature. And the chimneys, as I said, I like to photograph chimneys, on the outside of the palace at Sintra are gigantic, fit for a factory. And in effect, the message is, I have a bigger chimney than you, I have more money than you. Right? Sort of this figure, you know, the, 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 the more you want to demonstrate your stature, the more you want to demonstrate how you live. You know, the thing about that kind of thinking, unfortunately, is that once you have that kind of ego, I'll call it, it's very difficult to dial it back in a transition. So you understand the very difficult issues of the forces of change when it comes to social, the psychological element. But I hope I've illustrated in very short narratives that what's happening today is nothing new, that we can look to the past to understand some of the dynamics of the present to figure out what is happening. Now, fortunately for you, this isn't a presentation about my vacations. So let's get to the subject at hand. What is it then that drives change and transition? I have given you several anecdotes, and within those anecdotes, I have embedded themes of things like policy, economy, competition, technology. And in fact, if I bucket those, I call those the forces of change. And these are themes that I've been working on for well over 15 years, trying to understand what it is that makes society transition its energy circumstance from A to B. Let's take a look at each one of these. Clearly, environment is a force of change today with climate change, but that is nothing new. Environmental degradation has always been 
a very strong force of change. And when that interlaps with social, that too comes together in a very powerful way, because after all, people and society live with environmental degradation. We heard from the previous panel about environmental degradation in the air in Beijing. That is a huge impetus for change. But forces of change can also be forces of resistance. And there's a lot in this bucket in terms of forces of resistance and denial and things that I'll come back to. Policy, government policy, is a huge force of change. We know that. And when environment and society club together to put pressure on policy, then we start to see change happening. But it all has to be measured against prosperity, personal comfort, the ego issues that I talked about. And of course, in the economy and business bucket is competition, the competition between the clipper versus the coal-fired freighters. And then there's the capital markets, and who's going to pay for it all after all? Geopolitics, something we are now acutely aware of again over the weekend. Geopolitics has always been fundamental force of change in the world of energy because we have a tendency to fight over resources or to leverage resources for political gain. And I'm not happy to tell you that the fastest energy transitions have often happened as a consequence of military conflict. Innovation, I've talked to you about that. Innovation is a very powerful force of change, but I'll say it again, in and of itself is in an insufficient condition for change. We put these all together, and we have the six forces of change that I put together in a kaleidoscope, interleaving circles. And there's purpose to that, because no one is independent of the other, and the nexus of all of them together creates that cocktail that's required to do an effective transition or not. May the forces be with you. Notice the subtle change from may the force be with you, because it's the plurality of the forces of change that are important in a holistic sense, not in an individual sense that we have to consider. Let me explain. This now from my collection, 1820, in the same era as J.W.M. Turner. I don't know who the artist is, but it's a copper etching that I picked up a few years ago. Rather a bucolic scene, rather pleasant. Let's zoom in on it a little bit. We've got an agrarian economy, got some water jugs bobbing up and down in the front. We've got some uh, beasts of burden, the oxen drinking water also by the front, and we've got some biofuel activity going on in the back there. Um, it's a very sort of sustainable-looking picture, isn't it? It just seems like things are in balance. But the focus of the artist was potentially not so much on that as it was on the main object, which is the dilapidated, obsolete windmill. Now, why would the artist paint this? Right. In today's jargon, we would call this a stranded asset. But there is meaning to this, and you can take it further. He said, if you study art history, you understand that there are embedded messages that the artist often puts. Now, I don't think this artist was particularly sophisticated, but I like looking at art in detail. And you can see there's a couple of people sort of loafing around the front of that windmill. Perhaps they're unemployed. There was a lot of unemployment as a consequence of mechanization coming in, and displacing the status quo. That is both an economic force to be considered as well as a social force. And so one can think of the transition from wind power, because this is exactly the same story as Turner was saying, except this is on land, not at sea. We go from wind power to coal power. And it's that concoction, I'll call it, in the middle where you have the right balance or conditions the forces of change to take you from one to the other. I kind of like to call it the transitioner or transformer. We go from one state to another. Well, let me show you another example. I actually 
brought this with me because I, I just really love this, uh, this magazine, Top Notch Magazine. Top Notch Magazine. I, you know, I bought it for a dollar at, a, at an antique store. But I, you know, I, I love the artwork on the front. Take a look at that. You know, there's this guy on a horse, sort of a stunned face. Uh, you, you can tell what's happened here. This car in 1912 comes zipping by and, and the horse rider's startled, right? And then he just sort of you know, simultaneously takes his hat off and waves. But you know, what's more interesting is the car just clearly overtaking the horse with the millennials driving it. You know, this is 1912, right? And they're just saying, see ya, like horses are history. That is the message here. Like, make no mistake, we're transitioning. We're transitioning from a biofuel horse to a petroleum car. This is a new era. This is a completely new era, and the energy circumstance changes. Whether well, we go from steam through the transitionizer to the diesel engine, or whether we go from gasoline car to electric car. That's what we are trying to accomplish today. It's happening. We've had some great panels talking about it. And the question is, well, is the transitionizer appropriate? How far will it take us? Will we get full replacement, partial replacement of the fleet? Hmm. I think we have to think about what's in the transitionizer as we think about where we are going with this technology. You know, the difference, by the way, between what we're trying to do today versus these examples that I've given you is that we are really trying to force the transition in a very, very quick way because of the climate change issue and other issues of sustainability. We're trying to force fit. Right? But do we really stop and think, like, what are the right conditions holistically? What are the right conditions? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I mean, I'm just here to get you thinking about the subject. Right? Let's elevate it from electric cars and think about it. We've got the present energy state, which I can characterize with the three photos. Sort of very fossil-oriented, 85% of our energy needs still come from fossil fuels, and we're trying to go to this green economy aspirational state. I think we can all agree with that. I kind of look at this, you know, my original background was in math and physics, and I'm looking at this from an organizational theory standpoint. And, you know, if you, in, in these disciplines that I'm talking about, if you know state B, which is aspirational state, and you know state A, you, know, you can invert to solve for what the transitioner is. What is it that takes you from A to B? Are we doing that? Uh, I'd say no. So what's the problem? Well, I'd say the biggest problem is the issue of siloed thinking. In other words, non-holistic thinking. Right? Too much emphasis in any one of these things. They're all fragmented. We're just uber confused. It's like a whack-a-mole game. You try and put one of these out, and another one pops up, and it's just, you know, sort of an uncreated, unconnected. And as I said, there's sometimes just too much emphasis on one of the forces of change. I would argue, actually, there's too much emphasis on technology. You know, technology will save us. Hey, don't worry, we're going to transition. The scientists and engineers over there uh, are going to figure it out for you. You as individuals don't have to do anything, right? They're going to figure it out for you. Too much emphasis on technology. And then they wonder why you don't buy the stuff. Disruption, denial, and transition. We talk a lot about disruption. We've talked, that's the, well, that's the name of this conference. We talk a lot about transition. I don't know how many times you've heard it today. But actually, there's three phases from getting from A to B now from a psychological standpoint. Disruption, oh my God, what's happening? Denial, defensiveness, and then transition. Denial is sort of like a cocktail of human emotions, right? And it's problematic, hugely problematic. The more I actually get away from the numbers, and think about it. It's human nature. And it's not easy to talk about. It's just not easy to talk about, is it? Is it easy to talk about, hey man, you got a big ego. You got to dial it down a little bit so we save some energy, cut the emissions. It's tough conversations, right? 
how do we communicate? Well, I've thought a lot about that, and I'm going to take you back to my vacation, because again, we're very fortunate that uh, my wife and I got to see something that is really special. Some of you may have seen it in northern France in Bayeux, the Bayeux Tapestry. This tapestry is almost a thousand years old, and it's like a big long film roll, a series of vignettes, actually. See the letter number 20, 21, 22. It tells the story of the events that were leading up to the Battle of Hastings when William the Conqueror crossed the English Channel and conquered England. And after they conquered, the, they wanted to tell the public, hey, here's the story, here's how it happened. The problem was that the populace was illiterate. I couldn't read. So they said, okay, we'll make an 80-meter-long tapestry so you can go and look at it vignette by vignette. I mean, it's just like a big, long film roll. And you can see the little Latin lettering in there. There's, I think, max 144 characters, right? Just little, little, little snippets there. Some of you got that joke. Okay. Um, so it tells a story. It's not an interesting word. Story, right? That's, that's the important word. It tells a story in nice, bite-sized chunks, in vignettes, and it rolls along in a very interesting, and actually, if you watch it in an entertaining way, there's even some energy vignettes there. Okay? I mean, it's a bit grim, they're burning down somebody's property. Uh, but okay, that's an, energy, uh, that's an energy vignette. But if you think about this interesting way of communicating, after a thousand years, post Battle of Hastings, you know, we're at the Renaissance, and we got all sorts of incredible writers who wrote tomes and tomes of literary works that are just an explosion of knowledge. And a thousand years later, we're basically back to where we were, right? Where we communicate with imagery, right? Make little photos in social media, tag it with a couple of little tweets or whatever you want to call them, and uh, tell the whole story. Well, Actually, it's just kind of common sense, right? Like, I just, I just want to understand in kind of simple terms a story. Like, I just showed you the picture of the tanker, the Cuddy Sark, whatever, and you kind of got it. Like, I didn't have to go into charts and graphs to show you what's going on. So, as I was thinking about this whole challenge of how to design a transitioner in this highly polarized world that you've heard about many times today on stage, I sort of think also more, you know, there's a bunch of challenges here. Um, first of all, there's like a bayou tapestry rolling by every 30 seconds. Uh, there's just so much going on. Right? It's just like a crush of information. How do I sift through all this? And I think that, uh, you know, that's one problem. We're just sort of overwhelmed and there's a lot of anxiety. But I think the bigger issue is really something I would just call speak my language. We tend to not speak each other's language when we're trying to discuss things, whether it's oil or climate change or renewables or whatever, right? And, and what am I saying? I'm saying, like, it just like cut the jargon, man. I just, like, tell me what you're saying. And, and this sort of very quickly degrades into, you know, this group over here showing charts and graphs and all sorts of technical stuff to this group over here. And they say, I don't understand what the hell you're saying. And they say, what? Why don't you understand? Right? And then they say, well, why don't you understand my stuff and my charts and graphs and stuff? Right? And then it degrades into, you're not thinking the way I think. You should think the way I'm thinking. I, you know, and then, of course, you're wrong, I'm right. No, you're wrong, I'm right. And then there's just a complete brick wall. And I think this is just like exhaustion. And it leads into, I think, one of the most fundamental things that I'm trying to get across today. And that is, I go to countless roundtables and meetings and people talk as if they're the boss of the person on the other side of the table. I say, like, people are sick and tired of that. Right? Like, let's just have a conversation that's grounded in some sort of clear and simple issues. Like, you're not the boss of me. I mean, don't, it's bad enough to say, you should do this. I think we can agree it's doubly bad to say, you should think like me. Ooh, that's like mind control. 
I don't want to think like you. I want to think for myself. I want critical thought. But here's the difference. It's not what you should think, whether it's anybody on stage. It's if I say, I'm going to give you the tools of how to think. Think for yourself. Think with your peers. Talk about it. Well, let's go down the bio tapestry together and have a conversation about this. And that's where history comes in, really, because history is a crystal ball, right? We know the ending of the story, right? We know the ending of the Cutty Sark, and we know the beginning of when Turner started writing about the energy transition or painting. Right? But you know, I've been doing this for a long time, giving lots of presentations. I'd say 25 years where I talk about history and give you little vignettes and stories. I'll tell you, like, history is like a sedative. It calms people down. Right? Oh, Peter, we've seen this before. Okay, yeah, okay, how, how did it play out? It played out like this. Okay, now let's have a conversation around it. Juxtapose it to today, okay, what are the parallels? And let's have a discussion about tomorrow. I mean, it seems simple enough, doesn't it? We need to talk about it today. And I've been working on this project that I'm going to show you for seven years, thinking and innovating over and over again to try and think of ways that we can engage people in critical thought, right? using history, using stories, using lessons, and ways to discuss. And I just felt that there had to be a better way. And that really was the genesis seven years ago of the whole energy file philosophy. What is energy file? And honestly, it's taken almost seven years to figure out what it is for me and the people that have been working on it with me, because it's just unique in a sense that it's part museum. I've shown you pictures, artwork and photos and objects. It's part library, stories, short stories, things we can digest, not an entire book, just short stories, little vignettes. Right? And part business school, OK. Let's take the lesson of the Cuddy Sark. Let's take the lesson of the Climbing Boys. Let's just talk about it. If you put these three things together, if you put these three things together, then you get energy file. Innovation. Environment. Social. Economy and business. Policy. Geopolitics. Forces of change transform our energy world. Energy File exposes our energy transformation through artifacts, images, and stories of change. We focus, dig deeper, and reveal the forces at work. Expand your thinking. Learn from the past. Embrace the present and prepare for the future. Experience our energy story. Mm. Well, thank you. Well, I've been thinking about this a long time, and I've always wanted to stand on a stage and say, well, if you like those stories, you like the objects I talk about, go to my digital museum and you will be able to see things. And then that whole thing expanded into, well, go to my digital museum and read the stories. And so we have now in this project, which we've been working on for over, as I said, well, I've been working on it for seven years, but really in earnest over two, 
We now have 10 stories, and the book of compilation of the 10 stories will be out in the next few months. For those of you who want to meet me at the market, we have Stairway to Hell, along with the question and answers that make you think, not tell you what to do, uh, at the marketplace, so you can meet me there. Um, but it's not just about stories, books, as I said, that whole sneak peek at the incredible software that has been developed here, um, also with a team of developers for the last two years, allows us to share vignettes, things like these, this light bulb, which is in my collection. It's one of the very first metal filament light bulbs, and I can craft stories around that and lessons for you to think about. This old gasoline iron, yes, gasoline iron, that's how people used to iron all the way up to the 1950s. And just to give you some thought, well, okay, we had electricity in the late 1800s. Like, what took so long to go to an electric iron? And then you can think even more and say, well, wait a minute. We went from gasoline irons to electric irons. Why didn't we go from gasoline cars to electric cars? I guess the transitioner wasn't quite right. Hmm. Everything is connected together in Energy File. It's a connectivity of stories, objects, and lessons. We bring it together in a holistic manner so you can talk about the transitioner, to think about all the things. And we have all the forces of change that you can study either individually or together. The philosophy is to learn from the past, embrace the present, and prepare for the future. We do it through this very cool software, which I'm really excited. It's a digital museum, it's a digital library, and it's also a business school, all wrapped up in one. You'll be able to access it in the next few months. Uh, it's almost there, and uh, really excited about it. The business school part, well, that sounds a little bit elitist, doesn't it? Okay, museum, library, business school, hmm. But no, I already mentioned it. So much of energy is personal. So much of the issues are personal. And when you realize that everybody makes decisions about energy, when you go to the parking lot, turn over the keys to your car and fire up the engine, when you go and you flip a light switch, you are making a decision about energy. And so the business of energy is everybody's business. And when you realize that, then you realize that we are all energy files. Thank you. Thank you.